In the Lumen Mountains of the West, twa wellsprings quietly rise frae the ground. In on the slopes of Braria, the other in the shadow of Ben Anne. Their trickling threads are joined by others to grow and become the Berlin Dee and the Wendon Dawn. Harried or languid, Baith rivers flow doon through moor, forest, farmland and toon, pouring out into the sea where the granite city of Aberdeen lies. Over the years, communities have sprung up along these rivers, the waterways providing a livelihood for money. We work in fishing, transporting the goods, powering the mills and other trades. Though wiser life have changed, still the dawn and dee steadfastly course doon the hills and in a tween, through the ebb and flow of human existence. A colour skelp was steen and storm, re reach sides at tempest storm, and then on weety dark some wane, for winds ice and suns aflame, the burlandy is born. A snabrig harps her growing tide, till branching up a kettle pride, she's heels to go re out a crag. A frexome drop, this water hog, cowps doom, a Corey's bride. Hi and welcome to the hills and in a tween. I'm Grace and I'm your host on this story journey. In my work, I have the joy of introducing people to the outdoors to see them go and play and walk and enjoy discovering the beauty and nature. But this is not integral to the education of our youngsters, the majority of whom spend their lives in front of a screen and know nothing of the outdoors. What of our future? Who's going to be looking after our land and rivers? I had a dream for eight weeks to have one class and immerse them in looking at a river and what was in, on and around it with the support of experts. Well, four classes from four different schools came on board, two in the River Don and two on the River Dee. I gathered materials for classroom work and then I recruited volunteers and experts to support. With a grant from the Storytelling Centre, Sheena Blackhall and I went in to introduce and support the projects in school with story and song. And then they were out, down to the river, looking at the local area with the experts and volunteers. There were community groups, rangers, and in the classroom, scientists, gillies. Some classes looked at water turbines, others electro fishing. They looked at insects and plant ID, so many different things. And in the classroom, they looked at the historical use of a river. They looked at what a river is, the water cycle, pollution, sustainability. And gradually the classroom began to be filled with river murals of water and creative writing and drawings. It was brilliant. One class did a soundscape, another a rap, two a song. And at the end of the project, two of the classes produced a radio show for the local community radio station, Cheer Stephen Bly, and two of them presented to their own schools. In this film, I am going to be telling you a story, but interspersed, we'll be hearing from the children their stories and their experiences as the story unfolds. You've heard from Sheena Blackhall already. She recited a little bit of her poem, 
Deeside Journey. And now she's going to sing for you a little bit of Loch Nagar by Lord Byron. Ah, we ye landscapes, ye gardens are roses, and ye may the minions a luxury robe. Restore me the rock where the snowflake reposes, if still it be sacred. The freedom and the love. We've been learning about rivers. A river begins on high ground, all in hills and mountains, and flows down from high ground to the low ground because of gravity. The movement of water in rivers is called a current. The current is usually stronger near the river's source. Some rivers flow all year round. The passage where the river flows, it's called the river bed. In Aberdeen, there are two rivers, Don and Dirty. In Aberdeen, we get most of our drinking water from the river. What happens to fish when the river freezes? Only the top of the lake or river freezes. The water underneath has still got oxygen because it is trapped. And fish can breathe and swim all they like. People use rivers for transportation and as a source and for natural resources. For example, people draw water from rivers for drinking, bathing, irrigation, cooking, and for industry. People harvest fish, shellfish, and other animals from the river. Rivers carry water and nutrients. It had been raining for so long. When the family had arrived four days ago, it had been bright, beautiful sunshine. Dad had turned down this tiny wee road and round the bend, Mum and Helen had both screeched out, Stop! Dad, stop! Here's the place, here's the place! A lovely field of grass under big, beautiful trees. So it was all sun-dappled. And just beyond... A beautiful river glistening in the sunshine. They couldn't have asked for better. Well, they hauled out the tent excitedly, first time putting it up, and there were a lot of squeals and doing things wrong, but even little Jed helped. Helen was a great support, and the tent looked fantastic. And it was so beautiful that that night they had their dinner out under the stars. They'd gone to bed so content and the rain had begun that night and it had not stopped since. They'd hardly been able to do anything and now outside the tent it was a quagmire. What a mess. Mum, is it okay if I just go down and see the river for a wee while? Yes, Helen. Listen, darling, thanks so much for helping out with Jed today. I know you're pretty scunnered. Oh, well. I don't know if we're going to stay for much longer, said Mum. There's not much point if it's like this. Helen didn't want to go, but at the same time, she was bored stupid. She got changed into her swimming costume and her wellies, because that was the best gear for this kind of weather. And as she unzipped the tent, she realised the rain had gone off just a wee bit. She stomped off down to the river, the grass whipping against her legs. Wow, the river was a different thing altogether. Before it had been gentle and laughing, but now it was roaring and foaming. She was mesmerised by it. 
But as she stood there watching it with just a wee bit of rain coming down, she went, ah, something on her neck. And she looked down and her hands and her arms, they were black. She was covered in midges. No, no, she was scraping them all off. And she ran back to the tent. Mum, mum, give me a towel, give me a towel. And she scraped her head and oh. That night, dinner was quite subdued. They didn't want to play Scrabble or cards. Jed had been so grumpy and had fallen asleep early. So they all climbed into their sleeping bags, but as they did, they noticed the wind was starting to rise for the first time and the rain was now pounding on the tent. And Liz, Helen well, could hear her over that wind. Liz said to her husband Alex, the tent would be okay. Oh, hi Liz, don't worry. I'm sure it's fine. In the forest there was a willow tree, leaning down in the water. The ferns are green and curled up next to the trees. The pine trees are dark green, prickled and straight. Rowan brushes are shining in the sun. The forest is like a jungle. The river is sparkling in the hot sun. The air is fresh. I came to a grassy bit of weed. It was beautiful. And then a whole field of poppies. It looked like the field was red. What a beautiful day. I really like going to the science centre to learn all about the water cycle. We got hot water and I put it in the water and we got cold water and put it in. In the hot water when out in the cold water didn't go out. That's how it makes the clouds because the steam makes it like into a cloud. If the cloud, if it gets really heavy, it'll start to rain. <laughs> you cut a like, thing in your bottle, see how steam comes out, and, yeah. and that goes all the way up to the clouds. That's what clouds are, they're just steam. And when loads of it get up, it rains. Helen was woken by the sound of screaming. The wind was tearing through the tent. The rain was coming down in torrents. And then suddenly there was a screeching, scraping, tearing, and the tent was gone. And they were in the midst of that rain. It felt like buckets of water were being thrown on top of them. They were soaked through and in total darkness. They just all panicked tearing at their sleeping bags to get out, stumbling over what they didn't know, they couldn't find each other. There was just pandemonium. And then light sliced through that rain and lit them up in their panic. And they saw each other and they all merged as one, cuddling close against that weather. And then as one stumbling over all the mess of the tent and then into the mud, they went into that stream of light and followed it. It was coming from the river. They couldn't see where from. Heads bowed. Jed was in his father's arms. Mum's arm was around Helen. Closer and closer to the river they came. It sounded like an animal roaring. The light was flooding out from a tree without thinking. They just went up and in this doorway and a door gently closed behind them and they fell onto the floor a sopping mess and dripping wet and panting they looked up. The strangest of figures this creature with a long reddish brown beard, greenish yellow fern like hair, bright green eyes, dark brown smooth skin, wearing a kind of tunic. Well, they were mesmerized and staring, and this creature smiled. Well, hello. You are wet. 
Oh, said Alex, the father, yes, we, and thank you so much. My name's Ake. Oh, Ake? Uh, I don't know what to say. Don't say anything. Look, you're shaking, you're shivering. Come on through. I've got a fire on next door. Well, the four of them clambered up the mud and the wet, dripping off onto the carpet. Oh, said Liz, I'm so sorry. We're making a right mess. Ah, said Ake, don't worry. Come on in, get to the heat. I'll go find some towels and some bits of clothes for you to wear. And he went through and sure enough, he came back with a pile of warm, cosy towels. And he said, right, I'll away and make some hot chocolate. You get yourselves changed. Well, before long, they were sat in front of the fire, a cup of warm, hot chocolate in their hands, but they couldn't keep their eyes off this creature. For in Ake's beard, there was a wee mouse. It kept popping its head up. And the children could see that in his hair, there was at least one spider and maybe a couple of earwigs. Ake snorted. He says, have you seen my wee family? Uh, yeah, said Helen. And she said, who's that in your beard? They didn't feel at all scared of this creature man. They were just intrigued. Oh, this is my wee pal. You'll see that my beard it starts to grow bits of fruit and maybe a bit of fungi. And the mice and the, the wee insects, they love it. Oh, okay, said Helen. But Alex, he turned to Ake, he says, thank you so much, Ake, for taking us out of that weather. Well, I'm just glad I could help. We were just talking about leaving tomorrow because the rain has just been non-stop since we arrived. You poor thing, said Ake. But you don't have to go. That, that rain's going to blow itself out tonight and you're going to have sun for the next fortnight. Really? Aye. Do you know, said Helen. Oh, I know a thing or two, said Ake. And we can't stay anywhere, though, said Alex. The tent's wrecked, but you could stay in my house. Well, the family looked round. I mean, they were inside a tree and it was a nice enough room, but it was quite toty and Ake was quite big, <laughs> said Ake. That's not the only room. Come away. And he showed them a room just off this one behind them. And it was big and it was empty. He said, you can have this space to sleep in and you can use the rest of the tree as your own. Well, Liz, she turned excited eyes to Ake. She says, I would love to. This is amazing. And Jed was jumping up and down with excitement. Ake knelt down. What do you think, Jed? Would you like to stay? Aye, said Jed. I really would. Well, that's great. Well, how about you come through and I could tell you a wee story before bed. Would you like that? Oh, why, said Helen. And I'll get blankets. I've got plenty. So go make yourselves comfortable and I'll get the blankets and then I'll tell you a tale. The forest was dark, gloomy and deep. Wolves howled at the moon and stags rustled the leaves and ran off into the distance. In the forests were caves full of historical paintings and flaming stone fires. The elders went out into the forest to look for dinner using spears and bows. To catch their meal, they also looked for brambles and berries and hazelnuts which they ate with their tea. All the family wore clothing made of skins, which also went on their beds. In the mornings, they went out fishing. They fished in their boats made of hollowed out tree trunks using long sticks with sharpened flint. When the men had come with fish, everyone started painting. They crushed berries and herbs to make colorful paints and on the cave, they painted animals and the hunting techniques they had learned. 
Now, they had to make fire. The girls collected stones and sticks and used two stones rubbed together to make sparks. Soon the fire was going, and they roasted fish and nuts. While dinner cooked, the children played with toys made of sticks and stones, and once they had dinner, everyone got to work, making baskets, weaving willow, in and out, in and out. They used the baskets to carry berries and other things. It was getting colder. Winter was coming. The family had to pack up and travel downstream. They had to move with the seasons and follow the food. Many, many years and centuries ago, when the world was still young, there was ice. Ice covered everything so thick that nothing could grow. But one day a warming breeze began to blow. Every day it blew. And over the days, weeks, months, years, centuries, the ice began to melt. Drip by until underneath that thick crust rivulets of water began to flow which grew into rivers and burns and down into a sea and the land thawed and as it did within the earth within the soil little seeds began to awaken and put down tiny little roots and send up shoots and plants and bushes and trees grew. First the trees were just tiny saplings that every year grew thicker and thicker until the bark was strong and creatures began to multiply. Insects, birds, animals of all kinds and humans. Humans began to travel. Some on foot, some designed boats. And as the warm weather changed the seasons to become what we know as the year, they would travel north during the warming months and then as the seasons turned they would travel back down south. They came up to Scotland and then they would travel back down to Europe and en route they would forage and they knew the earth. They began to learn from the creatures the animals, how to live with a great respect for everyone. How would they come from Europe, said Helen? There's a sea in the way. You're quite right. There wasn't always a sea, Helen. It used to be dry land. No, said Helen. Yes. Tell me, Helen, what happens when ice melts? Water comes, yes. And where does the water go? Well, you already said, it makes the burns and the rivers. And as those burns and rivers grow, where do they go? Into the sea, yes. And as the ice continued to melt, those rivers grew bigger and the seas grew higher. So before there was no sea between Europe and Scotland. That's right. Animals and people used to travel. And I found the remains of what they've left behind. What do you mean? Tools? Bits of weapons? Really? Can I see? 
Well, you can, Sadiq, but not tonight. It's getting really late. And it's time for you folk to get to your beds. Tomorrow. Okay, said Helen. Tomorrow. In the morning, they woke to the sound of a wren. It was singing at the little round window in the room. They all grinned at each other. Oh, that was such a soft, lovely sleep. They touched the floor, it felt like moss, it was springy. Better than the lilos, said Liz. Aye, said Alex, it was. They went through to the other room. Ake had said that he'd be away, but he'd left porridge and honey and milk, and they ate very happily. And once breakfast was washed up in the river, they went to look at the men. The field was littered with the tent and everything that was in it. It was everywhere. So they set about different tasks. Helen was asked to take things down to the river, be very careful because it's still full flowing, and to wash as much as she could, like the sleeping bags and the clothes. And then she draped them over branches and bushes. The day was gorgeous. It was warm. There was a wind blowing and they were all so content. Jed helped Mum as she found the bits of food around the place and Alex, well, he had the big job of trying to wrap up the tent and the ground sheet and see if he could dry them out as well. By four o'clock they were exhausted and ready to eat. Dad made a huge pot of pasta and they were just sitting down outside to eat it when they heard a voice for the river. Is there enough for me? It was Ake and he came and joined them and that was a merry meal together. And once they'd eaten, Ake said, there's quite a lot of light left. Shall we go and see some of my favourite places? Yeah, said Helen. Yeah, said Jed. He was quite tired, but he still wanted to go. So up in his mum's posy, and off they went, up through ferns that were the height of Helen, and then through a birchwood up a steep bit of hill, and they came to an open place where there was a stone circle. Wow, said Helen. How old is this egg? Well, old. Maybe not as old as the people I was telling you about, Helen, but still old. You said you were going to show me some of the things that you found. Oh, I did. I did, said Sadiq. Well, I made this little salmon skin bag and Helen took in a breath. And, uh, yeah, so I found bits of flint, like... This, this has started to be worked on and, and then abandoned. And then here's another one that's half made. And then I've got one, a fully made one. Helen was looking at Ake with round eyes, but she didn't say anything. But then Ake pointed up the hill. He said, can you see up on the cliff? And they all looked up. Is that holes in the cliff? said Alex. Aye, it's caves. <gasps> Can we go up? said Helen. Well, not tonight. Look, the sun's setting. And they all turned round. 
It was a glorious orange sunset and they watched as the sun just gradually disappeared through the bed of clouds and below the horizon. And then they clambered back down and through the wood and the ferns. Jed was already asleep. Mum, can I stay out with Ake just for a wee bitty? Liz turned and looked at Ake. Is that alright? Aye, of course, no bother. So the parents went in with Jed. And Ake and Helen went to a bit on the river bank where Helen could take off her sandals and dangle her feet in. Ake didn't have shoes. He just put his big muckle feet in the water anyway. Ake, I've got something to tell you. Uh huh. I had a dream last night. Did you? Can I tell you about it? Aye. Well, and she told Ake her dream. Fishermen on the River Dee have noticed there haven't been a lot of fish recently. They think it's because of climate change and pollution. When young salmon reach the sea, they are smaller than before. They're being eaten by more predators, so there's less salmon coming back to spawn. Fishermen are putting nutrients in the water to feed the fish. Sometimes this can be a dead stag leg. They're planting different trees by the river. The trees shade the river and make the water cooler for the fish. Tree roots help strengthen the riverbank so that soil is not washed into the river when it floods. One of the big problems is pollution. A lot of fishermen's time is spent picking up rubbish by the river. Plastic is a big problem because people throw their rubbish into the river rather than taking it home. It had been a long day and Darian was tired. He'd been knelt by the river for hours working at this flint arrowhead. He had been taking flint from stones like this and working it with his flint tool to get the flint out and then using a finer tool still had fashioned these beautiful arrowheads. This was his fifth one and his best one. He held it up to the light and nodded, yep, he was very pleased with it. And he was just starting to put his things back into his little salmon skin bag when he heard a cry. Darian! It was Sari. She was running over the hill and behind her was father. We caught fish, she said. And sure enough, on the pole over father's shoulder were five beautiful silver fish. Yes, fresh dinner, said Darian. It had been a long time since they'd had fresh food. But Sari came running down. Darian, let me see what you've made. Show me, show me. And he held up his little arrowhead. <gasps> oh, Darian, said Sari, I think that's got to be the best one you've ever made. I think so, said Darian. And father said, that is beautiful, Darian. Well done. Oh, let's get back to show mum, quick. And back Sari went up the bank. Watch out, shouted father. And she raced them all the way back to the encampment. There were three families gathered there. They'd stayed together all winter. They'd made themselves little dwellings out of hazel, willow and mud. But they were starting to wear thin now. And they were delighted when they saw the fresh fish. At the fire that night, they all had feasted well. And when they went to bed, father said, Darian, that's the spring on the way. We're going to be seeing more people now and you'll be able to trade those arrowheads. I know, said Darian. I wonder what I shall get. Well, it didn't take long before he found out. Two days later, Darian was near the river. He'd been cutting logs. Cutting wood with a stone axe is never easy. And he'd had to sharpen it so many times. 
but he was on the very last log when he heard a shout from the river and he looked up and there was a small coracle and in it a man paddling like mad to try and push against the fast flowing current. Darien dropped everything and shouted behind him and at that shout everybody dropped everything and gathered their heather ropes which had long heavy stones slung on the end. They rushed down to the river bank and they lassoed those heather ropes and threw them out and the man managed to catch on to one and then everybody was hauling and hauling and pulling the man closer and closer to the bank and eventually he was out of the current and they pulled up that little coracle onto the pebbly shore. Oh, they were all exhausted and it took a while for them to get their breath back. But the man looked up, his face thin and gaunt, and he said, thank you so much. And shakily, he climbed out of his little boat. Well, everybody took the coracle and emptied it upside down to get the water out. And then Darren and the others pulled it up safely onto the grass bank. And Darren saw that there was a skim bag inside and he was away to pick it up and the man went, no, thank you, son, I will take it. Come, said Darien's father, you're soaking wet. Ah, I know, thank you. And father led them back to the encampment. You're welcome to share our simple dwelling and, and there'll be food a bit later. Thank you, said the man, but I have my own little tent and I think I need to rest. Well, night fell early and the smell of fresh fish cooking and flat bread. Well, the man poked his nose out his wee tent and he said, oh, that smells amazing. He went down to the river, washed his face and he came back, his beard dripping with water. And came and Daddy made room for him beside him. And they sat down and well, he ate voraciously. He was starving. And everybody politely chatted while the man ate. My name is Gary. And everybody in exchange told Gary their names. And you'll be wondering why I've come, said Gary. Well, let me get my skin bag. He returned with his bag and he plonked it down in front of him. And then he undid the thong and the whole bag flopped open. And inside, there were things that the people had never seen before. There were necklaces and bracelets that the women could not believe. Some made out of shells and some made out of the strangest colour of stone. There were little wooden bowls and there were little wooden birds and animals that the children looked at eagerly. But Darien had seen something that really caught his eye. A stone, a beautifully shaped stone. And when Gary saw Darien looking at it, he said, Darien, pick it up. Well, he did. And he could not believe the weight of it. And it was so smooth. Turn it over, said Gary. And he turned it over and it was ripples on the back. What is this, said Darien. I've never seen anything like it. We call this a lightning stone and it is believed that you only find them after thunderstorms and only in certain places. And you carved this? Yes, said the man. It took a long, long time. Oh, I can believe it. It's such a strong stone. Yes, we use them as hammer stones. Do you like it, Darian? I do, and I think I would like to exchange this 
for something I have. Say, so, Carrie, I, I don't think there's anything you could give me. Well, let me show you, said Darian. And he took out his salmon skin bag and he removed his tools. And then from inside, he took out his very best arrowhead. And Gary gasped. This is beautiful. May I hold it? Yes, yes. I've never seen such fine work. Did you make this yourself? I did, said Daddy. Yes, said Sari, he did. Well, said Gary, I, I'm very impressed. I have five, said Daddy. Oh, you do? Well, I think that would make a fair exchange. I give you the hammer stone for your five arrowheads. And Daddy was just a way to say, I agree. When a little voice over his shoulder went, not quite, Gary. It was Sari. She was looking very determined and very serious. It will be five arrowheads for your hammer stone and the shell necklace, she said, picking it up. Oh, said Gary. Is that right? And Sari nodded. Well, I, I think that would be fair enough. And he handed over the necklace to Sari. <gasps> I've got my own necklace! She was filled with glee, her eyes were sparkly. Mummy, mummy, look, I've made my own purchase. And everybody laughed. Well, everybody was very pleased with their own purchases. They'd all bought something from Gary and in exchange, they had given him basket work that they had made over the winter months. And two days later, Gary was ready to leave. Father had advised Gary that it was not safe to go further up the river by Coracle, so he was going to walk. He wrapped everything in his skin bag, tied it up with his thong, put it over his back, and then he took the Coracle and he put it over his shoulders until he looked like a snail and all the children laughed. They said fond farewells and wished him all the best. And soon he was gone. But Darian never forgot Gary. And every time he used his hammer stone, he would think on him. One day baby deer woke up from a long, long nap and she felt so hungry. She saw the other deer eating weeds up around the bush, but she didn't want any of them. I want strawberries, not weeds. Just before a baby deer could take a bite of strawberry, Fred the adult deer said, Oi, stop that. Baby deer turned around. Oh, I'm so hungry, said baby deer. But that day, she just went home starving. Next day, when she came back to Burley Bush, the baby deer started eating blackberries. Oi, said Fred, not you again. Come here, follow me. So Baby Deer followed Fred and he showed Baby Deer the weeds. She had some. Ooh, those are brilliant. So from then on, Baby Deer ate weeds, but once in a while she would treat herself to a strawberry or a blackberry. Under the dead wood slept a slimy fat leopard slug. He was recovering from feeling ill. He had eaten too much. Along crept a small, long-legged spider with a very big appetite. Hunting for bugs, his skinny, hairy legs tickled the slug as he climbed over him. Suddenly, from under the dead wood, out popped an army of wood lice, their sword-like legs digging into the ground as they charged forward. From behind the fungi, centipedes and millipedes came out at full speed, racing to get the best piece of food in the entire forest. Ake looked at Helen. I hardly told you any of that, Helen, 
And you say that Darian had a salmon skin bag. Yeah, and flints, just like you've shown me. That's amazing. And do you have a lightning stone? No, I don't have a lightning stone. But they do exist, I know they do. I would love to find one of them, is he telling me? Well, do you know what, Helen? What? I've decided that I'm going to spend the next days with you and show you this place as only I can. Helen's eyes burned into ache in the darkness. You're going to show us nature? Uh huh. Helen's like, can I go and tell mum and dad? You can. Well, it all began the next morning. Helen woke early and nobody else was up except Ake. And she crept through to the other room. Ake, can we go out for an early morning quiet walk? And that became the habit. Sometimes mum or dad might wake to go, but it was usually just the two of them. And Ake would take her to all the secret places to see the quiet things that you would not normally see in a walk. They climbed a tree by the river and they watched a kingfisher, its jeweled body, dive into the water and get a fish. And on the river as well, they watched otters tumbling and turning and playing coming in and into the water down the bank. Ake showed her the robin's nest, the beautiful eggs. And they went and saw the badger set. There were young badgers and they loved to frolic. There were foxes as well. And as they went, they looked at every insect. They saw every plant. And Helen was like a sponge. She just drank it all in. And during the day, the four of them would go with Ake. And the river was now much quieter. So it was safe to go in and wade in onto their knees and they lifted up stones and looked at the mayfly larvae and all the other things that you can find. Ake showed them how to guddle for fish. Oh, Alex's face when he caught his first trout. So pleased. They went up to the stone circle quite a lot. And one day, Liz, Helen and Ake went all the way up the cliff face to those caves. And they were just amazed. There were paintings on the wall, faded, ochre coloured, but you could see the shapes of animals, ancient, ancient. I feel like I'm touching the past. Yeah, you're part of the past, said Ig, and the present, and the future. And so it went on, day after day of glorious day. At the burn, we move stones to get the creatures to wake up and drift into our nets. Once we'd caught some, we took our nets and emptied them into the trays to examine them. Zooming around the water, we spotted the water beetle with its black shiny shell whizzing around on the surface. Next, we saw a mayfly with its two-pronged tail making it move rapidly in the water. And amongst the stones, the caddis fly slowly, moved around with its stone-covered back. The water skaters whizzed along on the water surface and the leaf hoppers climbed up the weeds. These creatures show us the water is clean. We went to Burley Bush, which is Kenley's community garden, because we wanted to learn about our community and some of our plants and flowers. I met Sue, who's our gardener, and she told me about the garden. I saw some cool plants and flowers. I saw lavender, poppies, and more. 
The lavender was purple. It smelled like mint. It was lovely. The paw pits were just opening and pretty, but they didn't smell like anything. We went to see some fruit and vegetables. There were potatoes, carrots, cabbage, lettuce, and tomatoes, and strawberries. The strawberries and tomatoes were kept in the greenhouse to help them grow and keep them away from the cold. It was fun. The last night came all too quickly. They'd gathered firewood and Dad and Mum had lit the fire all by themselves. They were like two kids. They were so chuffed. They got fish as well. And what a lovely meal they had. And when it was over, they just all relaxed, listening to the fire. It was a still night. Stars shining in a velvet sky. What's that bird, Sadiq? There was the sound of hooting. I think that's a tawny owl, said Helen. Mm hmm, Sadiq. Well, that spoon's coming on. Helen, you might just want to take that top off. Just okay, said Helen. She was whittling away, she'd been working very hard at the spoon. How many birds do you know now, Helen? said Dad. Um, maybe about ten, eight, would you think? At least ten, I would say. Liz said, that's just fantastic. I don't know even one. You don't listen enough, Mum, said Helen. I'll teach you if you want. Alec looked over at Ake and said, Ike, I don't know how to thank you. You've given us such a special time. You've given us so much of your time. Well, you don't have to give me anything in return, said Ike. It's just enough to see you enjoying nature. But there is something you can do, Alex. What's that? You said you're a teacher. Aye. Well, how about if you could go back to school and show your class some of what we have learned over this time? Alex frowned. I'm not like you, Ig. No, you're not. But you've got enthusiasm. You've got curiosity. You're like a big kid out here. Aye, said Alex. Aye, yes, said Helen. Take that back to the class. I'm sure there's experts can help you with the factual bits, which you don't really need very much of. You just need that opportunity for children to get out and explore and discover for themselves and start to ask questions. And then you can find out the answers together. Alex began to know. Yes, yeah, said Liz. Do you know, back at home, Ake, there's nobody like you. Nobody who loves nature the way that you've shown us. I've seen plenty of nature stuff on TV, but it's not been like this. No, said Ake, because you actually need to feel. You need to smell and see and listen for yourself. And then it's almost like it becomes part of you. Yeah. Helen said, Is there anything I can do, Ig? Well, you can show your friends. Because you've learned so much yourself. I said, Alex, Liz, will you be able to help me do this? Of course. We'll do it together said Helen. Don't you worry, Dad. We're a team. Aye, we are. Oh, I hope, said Jed sleepily. They all laughed. Well, the next morning, it was a sad parting. But they promised that they would come back and see Ake in the October holidays and tell him everything that they'd been able to achieve. 
and Ake watched them go with a sigh. I have really enjoyed going to the beach, picking up litter and learning about the River Dee because now I know to save the world and my class has started to recycle. Um, our teacher said that when she was at a park, she sat on the bench and it said it had been made out of lots of plastic bottles. And when we had a ruler in our class, it said I was made out of plastic cups. We're going to tell you about the Don Village water turbine. Don Village is a community built next to the River Don. Don Village decided that they want to help the earth by getting a green energy source. So they built a water turbine in the river to make electricity and they raised the money themselves. The water turbine generates electricity. So it uses water from the river to turn a big screw called the Archimedes screw and that generates electricity that goes into the national grid so anybody can use it. Do our own part to save the earth. Put rubbish in the bin. Instead of using plastic, reuse, reuse, recycle. Reuse, reuse, recycle. Cows, sparks, pollute the world. Eat me free, eat more veg. Minimize red meat, minimize leafing. Minimize red meat, minimize leafing. This film is just the brush of a butterfly's wing, a glimpse into what's possible for schools if they can be immersed in our land and rivers with the support of the experts. This project opened up dialogue and the children were excited about their experiences and their learning and this was reflected in the wonderful work that came forth. Their creativity was brilliant and they had such fun. My question is, can we prioritise the education of our future generations for them to be caretakers of our natural world, to be looking after the hills and in between? Take us.